Good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Luria with TMC for Seniors, and we have jumped into March, and we are talking all about brain health this month. Today, we'll be talking about the impact of brain plasticity. Frances West is with us here. She is a nurse practitioner with the Center for Neurosciences and the TMC Adult Neurology Department at TMC. Fran has um, has been with TMC quite some time. She has started as a registered nurse, and through her years, she went through orthopedic surgery, telemetry, cardiac intensive services, cath lab for special procedures. She went back to school. She got her uh, master's in nursing from the University of Phoenix in 2009, and she is a board-certified family nurse practitioner that has worked with Dr. David Teeple since 2013 as part of our stroke program here at TMC. Today, she'll talk to us about brain plasticity. Welcome, Fran. How are you? I'm well. Thank Hello. you. Good morning, everybody. This is a little disconcerting. Like, you're here and you're here. <laughs> I'm kind of old school. I had to get used to this. So I put your PowerPoint up so that you should be able to see it. And you do have an online audience along with our in-person audience today. If you're watching us from home, please feel free to leave any questions in the chat and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Okay. Shall we get going then? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So yes, all that is true. I have probably, I've been at TMC, I think a little over 30 years now in some capacity or another. I mean, I've actually worked ER too, um, but I've been in neurology for 10 years now and inpatient neurology for the last eight. In fact, well, it'll be eight years in April, I think it is. So a um, bit of a diverse background, but useful because it exposes you to a lot of different stuff. But um, a neurology, I think, surprising to me more than anyone else probably, ended up being a, a great love of my life. Now, when I was asked to do this topic, it's a little broad, frankly, because it's <laughs> like most things, you know, there's sort of the general knowledge and then you can start bringing it down. And I'd say that one of the things that you want to look at is, is the definition. So what are we talking about? Brain plasticity is synonymous with neuroplasticity, if you hear that term, or neuroplasticity. It's all the same thing. But, um, you know, fundamentally, it's the, the ability of your nervous system to adapt to changes, to respond, adapt. And uh, that can work both ways, though, right? You can have a negative effect where you lose function or a positive effect where you grow and you change because change is not always positive. And I mean that in the absolute sense, not in, like, happy or sad, meaning addition or subtraction in that sense. Um, so, you know, it can respond to internal cues, intrinsic changes, or external from the environment. An environment can be pretty much anything that's outside your own brain, basically. And that can be anything from your home environment to your workplace environment to the hospital to rehab, etc. Now, with my background, I'm a clinician, right? Um, and I deal with people who have pathology. You know, they've had strokes, traumatic brain injury, they had some kind of neurodegenerative disease, et cetera. So I deal with it from that side. But how you think of brain plasticity does really have a lot to do with where you're coming from. What is your own perspective? Are you an educator? Do you work in development, like childhood development? Are you a clinical psychologist? Are you a psychiatrist? Are you a neurologist? Are you a neuroscientist? Because neuroscientists deal with all this stuff but not in vivo, they're not dealing with patients per se. So it really, you know, how you think of it um, really does somewhat depend, or actually a great deal depend on what your background is. So we're looking at, again, I, I don't wanna like, you can read just as well as I can, but these are just kind of basic points to look at. And remember, brain plasticity pretty much embraces all the stuff going on in here from gestation. So it starts pre-birth, until you die, you know, it's it's not a process. Now we all know, because we see it around us, et cetera, we know that there are changes that happen through the lifespan, but never make the mistake of thinking that brains can't be doing stuff just because you're 90 or something, you know, or I mean, don't be an ageist basically. And I think that's, I think that's what a lot of the newer research is starting to show to us. Um, so we'll touch on that as we go along. Um, so 
Okay, it means different things to different people. So looking at it um, as kind of neuroplasticity is just broadly any kind of changes or using it like people that do what I do. So clinicians, it's, it's kind of um, an umbrella term for all different kinds of processes that, again, if you're, say, a neuroscientist or you're a clinical psychologist, you're going to break it up into these different categories and compartmentalize things. And from my side, we don't really do that. You know, we're just like, all those things mean neuroplasticity to us. But you can, if you want to get persnickety, you can divide it down. That's that's totally up to you and how much you want to go into the, the hardcore science of it and the technical definitions. In the day-to-day -day life, or, and again, given what I do, I don't know that that's all that useful. I mean, you can break down to individual neurotransmitters if you want to, and that's very technical. Would you do that if you weren't a neuroscientist? Well, maybe not, you know, or somebody literally working on like live rats or something. So structural is the strength of the connections between the neurons. So those, that's a literal anatomical thing. You could, if you wanted to touch it and hold it and turn it around and it would be 360. Um, functional is usually a little bit more about neural networks and things like that. So um, those, that's, that's really the, the trending science in neurology, even in things like epilepsy. You know, we're looking at networks now as opposed to anatomical parts of the brain. You know, we used to break it down to like, you have temporal lobe, you have frontal lobe. It's not that that's not meaningful anymore, but what we really learn over time is that it's never that basic, right? All these parts of the brain integrate with each other. They talk to each other. And so it's really networks and how these neurons connect with each other. And from point A to way the heck over here, that's a network. And so when you talk about plasticity from our perspective, what happens when some part of that network breaks down, you know, and what kind of a repair process goes on? So once again, we're trying to get away from strictly a functional definition of things and looking at integration. So um, uh, neurons, you know, you have your basic cell and then you have an axon, and then they have dendrites. So think of it like a little tree. So all these little branches and these branches connect with each other. So from neuron to neuron and then from neurons to muscles, and then there are the structural parts of the brain. And we're, we're also finding a lot more about that. We used to think that so much of the brain was kind of passive, like support structures, the astrocytes, the um, glio, um, the, those are that probably the big one. But all this, we used to call them support structures. But now I think, again, we're starting to find through the work of like these neuroscientists and things that they have an active role in themselves. You know, it's like when they started talking about dark matter in the universe, everyone was like, well, that's a black hole. Nothing's going on in there. Well, that's not really true, is it? Mm -hmm. Physicists are starting to show us that, you know, there are things going in there. It's just that your science has to catch up to be able to find out what it is. And so now we are learning more about those things and learning that they, um, once again, they all talk to each other. They have a role to play both in growth and development and in degenerative processes. And, um, you know, it's really difficult to come up with a good treatment uh, if you don't understand the pathology. And how do we understand pathology? Because, well, because we see it in people. Most of the stuff we know we learn because things go wrong. And you sort of look backwards from that. But, you know, I think one of the greatest examples of this is where do we stand with the di different dementias? There are all different ways to have dementia. We're all mostly concerned with Alzheimer's, but you know, new drug comes out, new treatment, but you know, most of those things, at least from my point of view, actually have very little data to back them up. You know, like you proved to me that Aricept, which is um, donepazil, it's an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. It keeps a certain uh, enzyme is acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. It gives you more in your brain, and that affects a certain part of brain function, like the, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and that's a big relay station, right? And so it's an integrative part of the brain. But, you know, that's a pretty narrow focus. It's just in one area. But there's no real good impact data that says that prevents people from truly you know, progressing or that it prevents, you know, that it's preventative and it's certainly not curative and you never get, it's only indicated for 
mild cognitive impairment or early dementia. But once people are on it, they never take it off because the thought is if you take it off and they do decline, if you put it back on, it's not gonna, they're not gonna go back to what that baseline was. But again, as far as I'm concerned, there's no real data that says it does a great job at that. And the same thing for Nemendo, which is the thing that, you know, memantine that you take for the next stage of dementia. And then when you talk about vascular dementia, frontotemporal, primary progressive, but you know, they're all different ways to have dementia. We don't understand the pathology of most of them. We, in other words, what starts that process? Why do some people get it? Some people don't. And, and Alzheimer's is absolutely one of those. Vascular dementia, we can all kind of get. If you have bad vascular disease and you have blood vessels and things that just have not been getting nutrition for years and years and years because you have horrible atherosclerotic disease, you've had multiple strokes or whatever. Okay, you can figure out how that would affect your brain function. But, but in something like an Alzheimer's, it's think of it as, you know, you have these neural networks, you have different pathways, and it takes those pathways away from you. That's what that disease does. But why? You know, we know that you have those fibrillatory tangles. You know, they talk about having the, um, uh, the, oh my gosh, I'm just having, pardon me, I'm having a green well, valley moment. Um, so yes, thank you, your amyloid plaques. Now we can find those now, right? You can get a tracer and they can take, do imaging and see that you have them. And then what? We have no idea what burden of plaque you have to have to have dementia. There are people whose brains have been studied after death who never showed any signs of dementia and you look at their brains, you're like, holy cow, that's a lot of plaque. No, so you know, so we do not know what's the correlation, how much do you have before you show that. And so when they start talking about coming out with these disease modifying agents like, you know, monoclonal antibodies, stuff like that, like the new one that was approved of, there's been such an uproar about that because the community's like, you know, some will fall on like, this is positive, we've got something we think we can help with. Well, you proved to me that that amyloid is the cause of the dementia, you know, because there are plenty of neurologists that will tell you, no, it's more of a tau problem, which is a particle in the neuron itself, you know, and they think it's a structural neuron problem. So, you know, this is kind of tangential, but really what it comes down to is if you don't understand the pathology, it's hard to come up with a good treatment and convince us all that that's appropriate. And these things are not cheap either. And are you going to get them approved? Even, even the imaging. Most, you know, most insurance isn't going to cover that, and those things are expensive. You know? And ultimately, how is that going to change our clinical outcomes? You know, I think where our science is just not there yet. But when you talk about plasticity, you know, we want to look at it from the perspective of um, what can we do to help people in the here and now, either to prevent decline or slow that process, or if there has been some kind of injury or assault to the brain, what can we do to help it heal? You know, And so that's why it's important to understand those processes, like how do these neurons form connections? How do they maintain them? You know, What is, it's, it's chemical, right? It's neurochemical, neurotransmitters, it's biological, essentially. So, and then are there things that we can do externally with medications or stimulators, other kinds of treatments that will help this process. So I put these definitions up here. Again, they're technical, but only so that when you see them, you can look back and go, oh yeah, that's that thing they're talking about. Because the concepts aren't difficult, but you know, neurology is just full of word difficulties, you know, like where you have to go home and practice it. So this um, equipotentiality started really when people were studying things like memory, um, which um, short-term memory, long-term memory, Different animals, they occupy different parts of the brain. So usually when we talk about memory, we're more worried about short-term memory. And, um, you know, so if it damaged, if you had damage to the temporal lobe or something, the thought was if you got damage on one side, then the other side can take over. Um, and there, you know, maybe some truth to that, and, and it kind of depends on what age you are. So, you know, if you're a child and you have refractory epilepsy, they can actually do a lobectomy about half your brain and the other half will assume a lot of those functions. Now, do they end up with no deficits at all? Um, you would have, no, that's it, but they can have pretty normal life once they stop seizing because if you're seizing constantly, you're definitely not going to have a normal life and it'll probably be a short one. So we know that plasticity exists, but again, that's, that's a surgery that's usually done before age 15 and that's old. 
you know, so it's a child thing. You would never do that in an adult because that brain would not be able to do that. It does not have the ability to take over that degree of function from the part that was damaged or removed. And why is that? Once again, still kind of working on that, but, but we can no longer make the assumption that just because you reach a certain age or your neurons are a certain age, that you can't form new connections or even grow new ones, you know, new branches, et cetera. Um, vicarative theory, that really is like a stroke and TBI is traumatic brain injury. So this is another one where it's like the healthy hemisphere kind of compensates. But you know what I see more? And when I read, like when I talk to physical therapists and, you know, and talk to people in rehab, physiatrists, et cetera, I don't think we're really looking so much at the other hemisphere taking over as we're looking at other parts on the same side. You know, you reroute, you have to go around that damaged area, build new connections. And that's going to happen on the same side where that injury was. Um, you know, I, I think a, an interesting way of looking at that is if, if you have somebody who is deaf from birth or had hearing loss at a very early age, the parts of the temporal lobe that process hearing and everything get taken over by other things. And so if you're going to intervene, like you're going to do a cochlear implant or something like that, you have to get them at a critical juncture because otherwise it literally is brain retraining. It's not like that, that part of the brain that normally processes hearing input is going to know what that is or understand it or be able to process it. So just giving somebody a device is not enough. You really have to train the brain, you know, <clears throat> And then uh, diastasis is, or diaschesis, um, that is focusing more on that concept of networks. And so, you know, you have neurons that talk to each other and these things, you know, can branch, some of these things are millimeters long, which in the brain is, you know, that's like I-10, but <laughs> they can extend a long way themselves or once again, that neuron can go this way, but it can also have 50 branches that talk to, you know, 50 or 100 other neurons. So if you have damage at one point in that, what happens at this end, you know? And so there are actually some researchers at MIT that have done some really interesting work. Um, it's a pretty recent thing, and they're doing it live. They're actually doing it in mice. They're narrowing it down to, like, single neurons. And looking at this is again done with neurotransmitters, so it's all chemical in a sense. And what they realize is if you do a direct stimulus to that neuron, um, and in this case they were doing visual cortex stuff, they will see the change right away. And what happens is that focus, that area where those neurons are being stimulated, begins to change right there in real time, live action. And so it will build up itself and build up its connections almost immediately that process starts. But the interesting thing is there's give and take because everything within like, you know, 50 nanometers or something like it, those other ones will start to degenerate. So, and, and then it is all, it's, um, it's arc is the name of the molecule and the neurons that are losing function because they're not being stimulated have more AMPA, which is again, another, um, neurotransmitter so but that puts them in a state of readiness so that if they are stimulated they have enough AMPA to make the changes you know so how that works is directly related to how stimulated that neuron is and by what and whether that stimulus stays or whether you stop it does that one start to degenerate but it affects the ones around it so you know you're sure like well yeah that's what you've been saying but you know until you have proof of it you can't really say it's anything more than a theory but once they can show it experimentally and repeat it, then we can say, okay, that's the science behind it. How do I translate this into something meaningful in people, you know, in real life? And I think, you know, we're talking more about the brain, but when I hear things like this, the, the, the excitement, a little bit of the excitement there is, is how is this going to translate for things like spinal cord injury and stuff, which is an area I don't think we've made a great deal of progress in. So, yeah, so... And I put this up here too, because you'll read things and they do use all these terms and they're not technically interchangeable. So just understanding, you know, that the neuroplasticity talks about the broader category, you know, the brain's ability to change, to adjust, to adapt. And it's really an adaptive, you know, um, phenomenon. And then neurogenesis is actually its ability to build those new connections, to put out branches. And you, you know, we used to say, 
you know, you had X billion number of neurons when you're born and, you know, from the time you're born, you lose them. That's really not true. Um, it, you, they will have, you can have pruning, essentially. If it's not being used, then the body's not going to support it. You know, why is it going to waste energy supporting structures that aren't being used? But the flip side of that is, if you stimulate something, that it can, you know, change the machinery and focus on that and, you know, build new networks. But it's not going to support things that aren't used, you know. And I think that's an important thing to understand when you are talking about both just the aging process and then if you have injury or damage. Um, synopsis, when we talk about the synopsis, neurotransmitters, that's literally this little micro space that the chemicals cross. And that is all done through things like uh, calcium is a big one in the brain, but it just has to do with chemical signaling, you know. One chemical opens up the gate, the neurotransmitter goes across. Some neurotransmitters control the gate. Some of them control the receptor sites. Some of them control how many receptor sites there are. So like I said, you can get as complicated as you want with that. But that's really what it is. It's a regulatory mechanism. And it's all based on electrical, uh, their, their neurochemical electrical impulses because you have, it's, um, it's a gradient in a sense. What's the word I'm looking for? And you can see I'm not a neuroscientist. I understand when I read it, but I'm not very eloquent about it. But essentially electrical potentials. So they exist at a certain level. And then when you stimulate, that potential rises to it till it gets to a point that it opens the door. It's like a lock and key mechanism. And then the neurotransmitters cross. Postsynoptic just means where's the target? Is it another nerve? Most of the time, that's what we're talking about is another nerve. And usually it's a branch of a nerve. It's one of these dendrites. Very few neurons are just long and straight. They almost all have branches, especially in the brain. A little bit different in the body. But um, that's essentially what's going on is the stimulus, what opens the door, you know, the, the key that opens the door, it goes across, finds its target on the other side. So, so for example, if you have autoimmune diseases like a multiple sclerosis, um, Part of the problem is the, the target sites, the receptor sites are being attacked by the body itself. And you'll end up with essentially neurons that look like Swiss cheese. You know, they have a coating on them. The deep brain neurons, they have a coating like, like wires. You know, it's like the plastic coating on wires. And it will attack that coating. And what happens is that impairs the impulses going across. Because if you think about it, the reason wires have insulation is so the electricity continues on smoothly. It doesn't get stopped. It doesn't slow down, et cetera. So it's quick firing. When your coating is taken away, then it can leak out. It can go this way. It can go that way. And so that, wherever that process is happening, are the symptoms you have in your body. You know? So what do we do to treat those things? We try to circumvent that autoimmune process you know you know you try to turn off that mechanism where the body attacks itself you know because it doesn't recognize itself as self and it's going after them like they would a bacteria or a virus so part of the plasticity will come from what do we do with those damaged areas that as far as we know don't regenerate if we can put them on medication to suppress that immune response, just like we do with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or any of those, if you can stop that, that gives the body a chance to go around the damaged area and build new connections, build new synopses. You know, you will get to a point where there's enough damage where that's very difficult to do. So that's why you want to diagnose people early and get them on treatment early. It's not that that treatment is necessarily going to reverse anything that's happened. But if you stop the process, you allow for recovery. You know? And, um, you know, we don't really talk about remission. Usually if you're on medication for one of our autoimmune diseases, you're on it for life. And that includes, just so everybody's aware, you know, multiple sclerosis is certainly a central nervous system disease. But that includes myasthenia gravis, which is also an autoimmune disease of the nervous system. But it attacks the junction, the neuromuscular junction, so where the nerves attack the muscles. And one of the characteristics of it is weakness. It can be weakness with talking, weakness with chewing, weakness with breathing. I mean, um, people can actually die from it because of the breathing part. They get double vision, they get droopy eyes, things like that. 
So once again, we start them on prednisone. From prednisone, we go to Celsep. You know, so they're on these immune modulating medications to allow those muscles to recover. And then we give them extra drugs to stimulate the muscles. You know, that's the um, the flip side of it is in that particular disease because it's a little different. It's not really in the brain. It's out in the body, but the benefit of that one is that it's people can have pretty nasty cases of it that are difficult to treat, but in general, it's a little bit easier to treat than some of the other central nervous system autoimmune things um, because we can give them, you know, rebastigmine, neostigmine, something like that that will help the muscle contraction, and at the same time, you reduce the autoimmune burden on them. They do not have to have the same kind of recovery of brain tissue, though, as somebody who has a central nervous system process, because essentially, if you get them controlled on medicine, you send them to rehab to build up their muscles, you know, because they've gotten weak, they've gotten debilitated. That's mm -hmm. their kind of rehab. It's not a matter of repairing stuff up here. It's because this is all, again, where the nerve meets the muscle. So you're in the periphery at that point. Um, so neurotransmitters. Here are the basic things. Just realize that they're there, chemically active. You've got excitatory ones you have inhibitory ones. So excitatory, just as the name implies, some action is involved. They ramp things up. Um, and that's not always a good thing. That's part of the problem with chronic pain, for example, is you actually want to inhibit the excitatory neurons, uh, the GABAergic ones. Um, so anybody here have neuropathy, familiar with gabapentin or pregabalin, which is Lyrica? Those are medications that affect these neurotransmitters. You're trying to calm them down. You know, normally what will happen in there is those neurotransmitters start firing. They go from cell to say, you know, it's like it tells two friends, it tells two friends, it tells two friends. And then you get something like this, this cortical spreading. We think that's part of the um, pathology, for example, of migraines. You know, once the process starts and then it spreads. And pain is literally in your brain. You know, you do get impulses coming in from the body, but it's up here that it gets interpreted. And that's why most pain research and everything in the last decade or more has really been focused on what happens up here. You know, if you want to help people with chronic pain and you want to modulate it, you have to understand what happens up here, because this is where everything gets translated. And a lot of that will be figuring out how to calm these guys down, the excitatory ones. Now, inhibitory ones, um, Glycine is probably the most common one, serotonin, and interestingly enough, 90% of the serotonin in your body is in your gut. So it does make you wonder, you know, where a lot of people are on SSRIs and SNRIs, which are classes of um, antidepressants, so serotonin and or norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So what those do is put more of those into circulation, and serotonin we think of the happy one, right, because it's supposed to be a little bit mood elevating, etc., so most of our um, medications focus on giving you more of that in brain circulation, you know. So, so what you're doing is inhibiting the uptake by those receptor sites. Um, and the same thing goes with something like, for example, Parkinson's disease. You know, you give people dopamine agonists or something that, you know, puts more dopamine in circulation because it's the problem is they don't have enough dopamine. You know, there's been degeneration in the basal ganglia and they don't have enough dopamine. And that's where all the motor symptoms come from. You know, Parkinson's is not just motor disease, but that's what people notice. They notice the tremor, the rigidity, et cetera. So when you're treating the motor symptoms, you get more dopamine. Um, and that is neuromodulation, if you think about it. That's what we're doing with these new medications, is we are trying to do neuromodulation. So we're either trying to give you more of the chemical, or we're trying, trying to take uh, or lessen the impact of the one that's giving you obnoxious stimuli. So, you know, it's really just understanding for that particular condition, what's the process, you know, what's going on in there, because that's what we want to target with either our treatment or our medication, because treatment isn't always medication, right? Um, that can be different things. It can, well, we'll talk about that a little bit further. And then modulators. So the thing about modulators, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like watching a debate, right? You have a modulator to make sure things don't get out of control. And so it's sort of like, guides and has a certain impact on what 
the other neurotransmitters are doing. But the hard part, especially if you're doing living research, is figuring out which one is doing what. You know, like, yeah, I can, you know, look in there and look in that little mouse brain, look in my Petri dish and see which ones are in there. But it's really hard to tell which ones are the active ones and which ones are the modulators, like which ones are modulating the effect of the others. So, you know, some of this new research that they're doing now and where they use the CRISPR, where they can slice in genes that have a very specific, a specific effect is going to be, I think, very exciting going forward because now we're going to be able to understand that process a lot better, um, and which will then, of course, help us come up with more effective medications, more effective treatment. Um, so I love neuromodulation because I think this is going to be, this is really going to be where we see success with our long-term chronic neurologic diseases, you know, is learning, not only understanding what the problem is at its very fundamental level, you know, that what is the actual biological process going on here that causes this pathology, but this is where we're going to find success because I don't think we're really at the point of, you know, we're going to do gene modification and give you an injection and, and that's going to fix everything. I mean, it sounds wonderful, but it's a little Star Trek at this point. Um, so, I, and I think this is where we've already seen success is, you know, that we can, you know, affect these neurons at their most basic level, but also at the broadest level, because you're really affecting the networks too. Because once you can start affecting individual neuron function, you're then going to be affecting the network. And that's where that plasticity comes in. You are actually going to be able to affect a change that will have a lasting effect, you know, because you will continue to give the stimulus, whether it's a medication or whether it's a, um, a device, but you are literally changing structural and functional aspects of the brain with those things. So, you know, that's kind of how I look at it from our perspective, our meaning sort of the, the general world of neurology and related things, you know, whether you're looking at um, the physiatrists, those are the people that do rehab medicine, you know, the physical therapists, et cetera. So for us, you know, the pure science, so that's all fascinating. And there are a lot of doctors that do pure science, but what we really want to know is, okay, so what's this going to mean for our patient population? You know, if I've got somebody who's had a stroke, if I've got somebody who's had traumatic brain injury, and hopefully down the road, we're really focusing on brain here, but looking at spinal cord injuries too, you know, I think a lot of this is going to be very exciting for them. Um, so, so again, we're looking at, our, but you know, here's the flip side though. When you give a medicine, you know, you're targeting a very specific thing. So that's a pretty narrow focus. And once again, I can't, you know, emphasize enough that you are talking about more than just anatomy, more than just a specific area or a specific problem. You're, you're looking at basically how is the context in which that exists. You know, we are, I think we need to take more of a whole brain approach, if that makes sense, you know, um, and just looking at, again, how can we integrate all these different processes to help the problem, you know, to help recovery. So um, deep brain stimulators, anybody know somebody with Parkinson's that has a deep brain stimulator? Right, and so it's just for the motor symptoms. So everybody should understand that it's just for the motor symptoms, but it is amazingly specific. They can use it for people with a central tremor too, and it all has to do with very precise placement in the brain. So that's what a neurosurgeon is for, and they do mapping and things like that. And then you get this, Usually nowadays, they almost, I don't think they ever just put it on one side anymore. I think they do both sides. And then you program them separately. And I was a cardiac nurse for a long time. And I was like, I can program. I know pacemakers. Oh, my gosh. DBS. So you've got your generator down here. That's what you usually see. But that's just the generator. But that's the battery. And then the wire goes up, and it's deep in the brain. That's why it's called a deep brain stimulator. And each one, literally, you can individually program right and left and there are probably let's see 12 different poles maybe they're 18 now i don't know i think they've just made some new progress in that and so each one of those probably has anywhere from two to four settings i think you know like multiple levels and so you can just fine tune this amazingly well you know and and it has to be done over time and ideally if you can get good response to that um, and it's not a quick thing. They go into clinic, the person looks at them, how are you doing? Let's watch you walk, tell me what symptoms you know, you're having, how's your tremor, et cetera. And then they start tweaking. 
and then you have to wait a few minutes and then you test them. Um, and it, you know, so it, it is absolutely fine tuning, but the idea is that if we can get that um, as precise as possible without causing side effects of like hypermobility and stuff, then we can pull back on your drugs. You know, I don't know, you know, we never promise people, oh, we're gonna take you off your medications altogether, but ideally you'll cut way back on them because since this is really working at the level of the problem, like in these in the basal ganglia, then you're gonna have fewer side effects from it than you will from taking dopamine agonists. Because if you've ever if you've ever seen somebody who's on Cinemat, you know, Parkinson's is progressive. So over time you end up taking more medication. And you will find that people will have um, what they call akathisia, and you know they're sort of like doing this and there. Doesn't bother them because the flip side of that is if they don't take that much medicine, they're stiff and they're frozen. And there's nothing they hate more than that freezing. So they're willing to put up with this. I had a guy and he was one of the early onset. He was probably about 49 and he was in the office just moving constantly. And he had just no idea what he was taking. I used to laugh because I was like, all right, I know. I know you just have a little candy dish there. And every time you walk by, you're taking something. And we don't know if you're taking short acting, the long acting or whatever. But, but that was his thing. He's like, yeah, okay. You know, he didn't really notice it that much. He's like, but I've lost about 20 pounds. I'm like, you're doing aerobics constantly. <laughs> and so, you know, so it was sort of like, let's let's get you on the schedule. Let's figure this out. And I'm going to have you see the neurosurgeon because he's a young guy. He has horrible motor symptoms. And so, and he did end up with a DBS. But, you know, you can see why medications have their limitations. You know, but so this this is neuromodulation, really very direct route. You put that deep brain stimulator exactly in the brain where the problem is and you program it. And hopefully you get them off medications that are making them do this. And, you know, and, and like I said, there's no free lunch. Dopamine agonists, it's, it, you know, it's a very common neurotransmitter in the brain. It's not limited to these motor things. It can affect how you think. People get, um, you can have somebody who develops horrific um yeah you will you know essentially it can change behaviors you know they can uh, just the impulsivity i guess would probably be the best way to put it and, you know and like this is a person who's you know maybe you went to church five days a week and was a, just a very calm gentle thoughtful person and the next thing you know they're down at the casino five days a week or you know watching porn on their computer or something you're like and it's just horrifying for the, the family it's you know because it's it's just this huge you know sort of personality change but it's not really that's how they've responded to the dopamine and that's not always predictable we know it happens it doesn't happen to everybody but it can and you know you're sure like you know horrified but laughing but it's not in the least bit funny when it happens you know people can take a road trip and end up five states away, you know? So medicines are not without real, you know, or potential side effects. And you always have to bear that in mind. So, you know, you never just want to like, throw stuff at people without a talking about it and just being you know, mindful that you're looking at other options too. And the other reality is with something like Parkinson's, as with every neurologic disorder, they need, therapies they need to keep moving particularly because they have the stiffness they have the rigidity they are they do that retro pulsion where they stand up they go back these are folks who need to keep moving they need to keep the best physical function possible because that's safety also you know um many of them will get injured with these falls and things so what we what can we do to minimize the falls certainly treat their motor symptoms but also keep moving you know no matter how much medicine if they're just sitting in a chair all day long that's not gonna help, you know, no matter how much cinema you give them. All right, um, so, oh, vagus nerve stimulators, near and dear to my heart because uh, the neurologist that I work for is actually an epilepsy doc. So when we worked outpatient, probably, I don't know, I don't actually know what the percentage was, it was high of our patients were epilepsy. This is a vagus nerve stimulator um, is something that we use to treat epilepsy. I think of it as overdrive pacing. Basically you get some abnormal, electrical activity starts, the device can interpret it, and then we put, we do the settings. And so essentially we say, all right, for a full minute, when you recognize that for a full minute, you are gonna send 
an, a fast electrical impulse to override that one, you know, so it doesn't take over the brain because epilepsy is essentially an electrical storm in the brain. It's abnormal electrical activity. So all this, these neurotransmitters gone wild. So that is neuromodulation in the sense of I see it, I recognize it, just like with pacemakers. Pacemakers are programmed to monitor the heart's electrical activity. If they see an impulse go through and it's within a certain time frame, measured in milliseconds, then it doesn't do anything. If you don't kick in with a um, with an impulse in the upper chamber of the heart, or if you've got that and you don't uh, kick in with an impulse in the lower chamber in a time frame that's pre-programmed, the pacemaker will do it for you. Um, and so that again is really neuromodulation because um, those the vagus nerve, this is a vagus nerve stimulator, the vagus nerve when it goes down this way is actually what innervates the heart in the upper gut. So it's all connected. Um, but when we put the vagus nerve stimulator in, there's actually a block so it doesn't go down this way because we if you stimulate the vagus nerve, it drops your heart rate and it drops your blood pressure. So that's not good. So, uh, but when you do it in the brain, it's, um, and they even have magnets themselves. So that if they feel an aura, like some people have an aura, they have a, it's really a simple partial seizure, but it's their warning sign. They can use that magnet, activate the device, put it into that overdrive mode to break the seizure so that it's, you know, much less severe, very brief if you don't just cut it off altogether. So that, again, neuromodulation at its finest, you are attacking it at the source. Although this is, it's, um, that that vagus nerve is one of your cranial nerves so it's an interesting surgery because it's neurosurgery and it's ent the ear nose and throat guys because you know the neck is a delicate area if you think about it i mean there's a lot of stuff in there including your carotid arteries so they usually have the ent guys they do the dissection and they get to the vagus nerve and it's a little coil that goes around it. And again there's a block so it doesn't go south and do anything with the heart and it's programmable you know, so you, you know, we have different settings on that. Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation and then like electroconvulsive therapy, ECT. This is not like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, but it is kind of. But these are things they're doing in psychiatry now. You know, so there's a lot of crossover between psychiatry and, and neurology. Um, you know, it used to be like if it was functional, if it was anatomical, whatever, if that's neurology everything else is psychiatry, you know, but really there is a lot, a lot of crossover. And, and so we have certain things that we use that we found incidentally help in other areas. So we found that with the vagus nerve stimulators, interestingly enough, that seems to help people with depression. It does seem to help. And I think that sort of ties in with the electroconvulsive therapy because um, that's done under anesthesia and everything, but essentially they're defibrillating the brain. You kind of shock it. You give it a chance to reset. And the idea is that when you do that, that your function, you know, the or the dysfunction that's involved in, this is for people with major depressive disorder, refractory to treatment. They've usually had huge issues with, you know, um, suicidal ideation, maybe suicidal um, events, et cetera. So this is, this is not a treatment for just like the person who has general anxiety or episodic depression, you know, because a family member died or something. These are people who have serious mental illness. And then that is essentially what you're doing is kind of resetting that brain. And that's what we do when we defibrillate. You know, the heart's in a chaotic rhythm. The electrical impulses are going wacky. We defibrillate. Yeah, it's a little scary. You're like, oh, and then it, but that allows it to reset and come back in a normal rhythm. You know, when it works, that's exactly what it does. And so now we're trying, I'm simplifying it, and you'll forgive me, but that is essentially what we're doing in the brain. And I think that we'll find with time that there may be some other things that we can do. You know, Timothy Leary didn't do us any favors back in the 60s with the whole LSD thing because he turned it into this counterculture thing, and then they all became like Schedule One medications. But there was actually promising research in the day with some of these chemicals, including LSD, that they could really help with people with what we that category of what we call serious mental illness. So those are things like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, you know, the ones that are so difficult to manage. And let's face it, antipsychotics and things are no free lunch either. They are no picnic. I mean, people get nasty side effects from those things. And it's a population that's difficult to treat because they're like, well, I feel fine now. And then they stop taking their meds. And then, you know, you see them again when they're in crisis. But there are many of them that don't want to take those medicines because they make them feel awful. And some of them have other effects like, um, you know, they give people 
uh, like a metabolic syndrome, you know, you might get the weight gain and things like that, and it sets them up for other health issues, you know, diabetes, whatever. So, and then interestingly enough, it all comes down to those neurotransmitters in psychiatry that you actually use a lot of epilepsy medications to treat, you know, things like Lamotrigine, Depakote, et cetera, those are epilepsy meds. But we know that they can have positive effects on mood stabilization. Or conversely, we'll have people who are syndromic, usually the kids, the young adults, um, meaning, you know, they were born with maybe genetic syndromes, um, that the behavioral components are a big part of it, especially when they're post-puberty. We have epilepsy meds that kind of, we call it psychomotor slowing. It kind of slows them down, brings them down a little bit. Topiramate would be a perfect one. A lot of migraineurs take topiramate. You know, it's one of the first line medications for that. So... I, I think it's always good if you can get a two or three for one. If you've got a medication that's successful treating one disorder, that's a neurotransmitter disorder, in other words, it's a brain problem, why not try it on some other things? You know, you have to do it judiciously, you have to be careful, but it just tells you how interrelated these things are um, because we do see this. And many, many times we find out that this uh, drug is helpful for some condition completely by accident. You know, we're looking for something else. When I was, um, oh, bladder stimulators, that's another one. I know nothing about urology, so I can't say too much about that, but they do actually make bladder stimulators. And because smooth muscle and smooth muscle contraction, right, and that's usually what you're dealing with with the bladder is that it's either floppy or often it's overactive. And so once again, you can try and treat that with medication, but those medications do have side effects. And especially if you're older, a lot of the side effects are ones you don't want because they tend to be sedating, right? And we don't need people falling and being groggy and things like that. But if you, so smooth muscle is innervated by what? Nerves. <laughs> so, you know, if you stimulate those nerves in a certain way, it can help control the tone of the bladder. Um, so, and you know, you can look at spinal cord stimulators. What they will do there is the same kind of thing that that vagus nerve does is kind of overdrive pace. It's like they can override the noxious stimuli that those nerves are putting out by going one up, you know, and stimulating past it. And you get the same kind of effect from something called uh, capsaicin, which is that the thing that makes chili peppers hot if you use that topically, the idea is that is such a noxious stimulus that your brain will just ignore it after a while. And that's why it helps with pain, because it's like, I'm just not listening to that anymore. You've oversaturated me, you've overstimulated me. I mean, that's really essentially what it does. And so we try variations of that with, again, direct nerve stimulation, or frankly, they can just ablate them. They're just like, people used to get that. Um, anybody remember back in the days when we used to do the ones for... Um, the what's what's the word I'm thinking about? I think it was I think it was for the horrible gastric ulcers and things like that. And the people had this. I mean, they would literally just ablate the nerve. Um, I, that's a pretty extreme measure, and so that was never a first line treatment for anyone. But you know, for some people, that made the difference. I, I haven't seen that in years and years, so I don't think we do that anymore. Um, so the conventional wisdom, again, when you talk about brain plasticity, right, you're born, born with X number of neurons and they just die throughout your life. There is some truth to that, but part of it is just understanding, and we're not here to talk about child, you know, infant and child development or anything, but part of that is to understand is you're like tabula rasa, right? The minute you're born, you start integrating with the environment and with the world, and so then you start making these networks and stuff. So... So there's, again, it's, it's really just kind of pruning and stuff. It's stuff you don't need, things that aren't being used. Yeah, that's going to, you know, degenerate and go away. But the key thing is you can grow new ones or you can grow new connections. And their brains are essentially hardwired to do that. And we seem to think after you get through young adulthood that really, you know, that doesn't happen. It's not true. Um, maybe we're not quite as, we don't have the same facility with it, but the capacity is still there. The capacity is still there. And so I think, and you know, and we're, we're looking now, there's some science that indicates now some of the research going on is even there may be some regeneration in the central nervous system. We know peripheral nerves can regenerate. It's not a quick process, but it can happen. 
I mean, this is what we hope for in people who have Guillain-Barre, right? It's like the end of the multiple sclerosis of the peripheral nervous system. But we know those nerves will regenerate. Again, not fast process, but it happens. But it looks like there may be some of that going on in the brain that we just didn't realize before. Um, and, it, and once again, looking at that dark matter, what are all those support structures for? You know, there is nothing in the body that doesn't have a purpose. We don't just, okay, maybe the appendix, but you know, we, <laughs> we really don't have very many things that are there that don't do, that are just inert. So I think we need to find out more about those too. You know, what is that interaction there? But, you know, the, to me, the key thing when you're talking about brain plasticity, when you get older, is to not accept these conventional wisdoms that, eh, you know, it's like, all right, what I got at 60 is what I've got. No, everybody has the capacity to learn more, but the way we tend to manage it is, you know, we're like, well, a certain amount of this just goes with age. No, I don't know if I really buy that because, you know, we can look at around, look at ourselves, look at our friends, our neighbors and everything and see such a broad difference in how people go through this process. And so, Getting back to Alzheimer's. So what does Alzheimer's do? One thing it takes away from you is your ability to learn, right? You cannot lay down new information because you've had this neuronal damage. I mean, that is the truth. If you talk to anybody who has a loved one that they've dealt with that has it, they get so frustrated. Um, and it is frustrating, but you can't argue with them that you're never going to get anywhere. And um, it, it's going to be a bad outcome on both sides. But the reality is, I don't care if you tell them something 50 times, they are not laying down new memories. So they are not going to remember, you can't let the little dog in the backyard because the owl's going to get it. They are not going to remember to close that dog door or whatever it is, you know. They, so it's not just the forgetting part, it's the I can't lay down new memories. And so how do you protect your brain from something like that? Well, there's nothing that we know of, no medication, no, you know, lumosity or whatever that's really been proven to change the process. The way you protect yourself is lifelong. If you have three pathways to get from here to here and Alzheimer's takes out two of them, you're living on one. And so that really functionally diminishes your capacity. But if you had an active brain throughout your life, and it doesn't mean you have to be a college professor or anything like that, that's not what I'm talking about. But if you have 50 pathways, you can lose a lot before you even notice it. You know what I mean? That gives you more of a cushion. So lifelong, you want to be like a kid. You want to be like, wow, you know, the wonder of everything. And, you know, because so, you, you have to approach it from, think of it as multimodal, right? It's not just your cognition like doing crossword puzzles or something. It's it's the engagement with your uh, fellow human beings, you know, staying socially engaged. You do not have to be a cheerleader. You don't have to go out every night. You don't have to be hanging out at the bar, but you have to maintain social contact with people. You have to get out of your house and do something. You have to exercise regularly to whatever capacity you can. And everything can be modified. Everything can be modified. If you have terrible joint pain, terrible arthritis, pool, you know, something that takes away gravity. Um, and then, frankly, even with bad joints, um, movement helps. It sounds counterintuitive, but it really does because what it does is help strengthen the structures that support that joint. And so thus you have less pain and you have more range of motion, which means you do more, which means you have less pain. You know, it's all... It reinforces itself over time. I mean, none of these are a quick fix, but ideally, if you're doing these kind of things, staying active through the course of your life, both mentally and physically, then you'll have less stability as you go through life. Or if bad things happen to you, whether you have a stroke, you have a car accident, whatever, your recovery will be probably better compared to a person who, in all other respects, is just like you, but is an inactive. Do you see what I'm saying? So start with a good baseline, you know, start with a good baseline. And, you know, and, you know, for, so for me, an example is I, I literally have a little group we call the old lady gang, we're the old IG. And we do Tuma Mock, like usually four or five days a week. And, you know, there's sometimes there are only two of us, sometimes there are five of us, you know, it just varies. It's like, if you're there, we're going, if not, it's fine. But, you know, the thing is we're doing that hill. So we've got some, you know, engagement and physical activity. But it's not always rote activity because you do want to change it up a little. If you do the same things all the time, you're not building any of these things. 
but we're engaging in conversation, you know, whether it's talking about what crappy thing happened to you at work or, you know, what your grandkids did or, you know, it's, it can be positive, it can be negative. I'll tell you if it's negative, we go faster. But, um, <laughs> but you know, so like, but it, it's that exchange and that kind of uh, exchange of information and just, you know, being supportive to each other, whatever, whatever the need is at that time. But, you know, and then there's the exercise, but it, you know, like I said, there's no particular one thing. I, there's nothing wrong with doing crosswords, doing words. If you do crosswords all the time, start doing Sudoku and challenge your brain that way. You know, because you need to get out of your rut, even that mental rut. And so learn a new language. You don't have to be fluent. If all you can say is where's the bathroom, that's fine. But that's forcing your brain to learn new tasks, which means you are going to get this neurogenesis because Brain plasticity, like I said at the beginning, also encompasses degenerative processes. If you're not using those neurons, they'll atrophy, they'll go away, they'll, you know, the little, you can, I mean, you can watch this on a slide, you know, that, or like on an electron microscope, those little dendrites will start retracting in, they'll lose connections and stuff. So you want to do, th and, and pick a thing that you like that's important to you. Or that's interesting to you. I mean, you don't have to go out and do things to punish yourself, but you always want to push it a little bit. Push yourself a little bit so you're not quite comfortable. You know, you don't have to be an ultra marathoner, but if you're somebody who, uh, you know, you don't really like to walk, borrow a dog. You know, um, and, and actually, no, truly, having a pet is often good because it sort of motivates you. The poor dog. I mean, that dog is relying on you, so you have to exercise it. Um, you know, or you find a friend who's got one and walk with them. Or, you know, take up pickleball or something. If you're like, oh, man, I'm terrible at sports or whatever, take up pickleball. You know, do something that, that pushes you a little bit, that makes you stretch your limits. And the same thing intellectually. I mean, if you haven't played, you know, your violin since you were in high school, pick it up again, you know. You're not going to be the same person you were there. You may not have the same dexterity. It doesn't mean you can't play well or you can't learn. It's for you. Who cares what you sound like? You know, if you want to go out and play in public, that's great, but you never have to if you don't want to. So I, I was just reading an article, I think it was in the Times sometime in the last week, about a lot of people started doing that in COVID too, you know, just went back and picked up an instrument that they used to play when they were young. And you're like, oh yeah, I kind of I enjoy this way, you know, more than I remember. But again, there that's that that new stimulus that, you know, and it doesn't always have to be a new thing. It can be an old thing that's new to you that you haven't done in a while. Knitting would probably, if you have never knit or crocheted before, learning the manual part of it, you know, that's a physical task that you have to learn. And then learning how to read patterns and things. Now, does that mean if you're like me, it's like you get through and you've done 20 rows and you're like, oh, they dropped a stitch or, you know, that is not what it was supposed to be. You pull it out and start over again. It's okay. You know, it is, it's okay because it's, you know, it's not a contest. You're not in a race for anything. You're literally trying to just keep your brain occupied and, and learning new things. So the, the hard part is staying out of rut because, and it doesn't mean don't do the things you enjoy, but you know, again, push yourself a little bit. Um, and, and I can't um, stress the physical thing enough also, because if you go back, even all the way back to the Greeks, right? And then of course the Romans as they did co-opted everything the Greeks did. And you know, but, but that whole healthy mind, healthy body thing, that's really true. If you talk to Dr. Tiefel, because we've had many conversations about this over the years, one of the most <coughs> brain protective things you can do is to stay physically active, whatever your capacity is. Again, it does not mean you have to go and be a you know triathlete. You don't even have to go to the gym. Be a gardener, you know, walk your dog, whatever, but do something physical. And really, probably every day is better, but as many days as you can manage. We used to say, okay, 30 minutes a day, three days a week. And that was so people wouldn't get intimidated. But really, it should probably be at least five days a week. And, you know, 45 minutes to an hour is better than 30. We don't have to do it all at once either. You can break it up. It's, it's looking at cumulative effect. So if you want to do things for five or 10 minute stretches, fine. That's fine. You know, there's, there's no pre-programmed something that everybody has to follow. You know, it can be very individual. And, and you know, tailor it to yourself and your lifestyle. Um, Although based on my friends with grandchildren, I don't have any yet, babysitting the grandkids, you should take with caution because yes. that's tiring <laughs> from what I understand. It's fun for me to go over and visit the baby, but uh, I guess it's kind of tough if you're watching all day. Um, 
Yeah, so practical benefits, just what I was talking about. You know, so it's it's that that ability to learn new things. You don't ever lose that. You do not lose that. You can always learn something new. Um, you want to enhance and improve your existing cognitive ability, right? Because that's going to be one of your preventative things. If you're continuing to grow, make new connections, learn new things, you have more cognitive reserve. When you talk to us in the hospital, we're all about the cognitive reserve because people come to the hospital, especially our elder elders, and they're ill with something, and I don't always know what their background is, and then all of a sudden they've got hospital delirium. Well, you know, hospital delirium is a real thing. It can happen to anybody. But if you have a lot of illness and you're older and you maybe don't have the greatest cognitive reserve, meaning you're somebody who already maybe has a little mild cognitive impairment or early dementia, that is really, you're, you are right to be set up for an episode like that because now we're taking you into a totally unfamiliar environment with a ton of noxious stimuli. There are people you don't know, alarms going off, people doing stuff to you and, you know, and it's very disorienting and plus you're ill, you know, you may have an infection, whatever the case. So, um, you know, we see the consequences of this on my side all the time. Um, what was I just thinking of too, as far as that goes, even with delirium, cognitive, blah, blah, blah. And also don't let anyone fool you that people suddenly become demented either. You know, because they're like, oh, mom or dad was fine two weeks ago or whatever. I'm like, did you see mom or dad two weeks ago? You know, because it's often the kids that live like three states away. I talk to them every week. When was the last time you were in their house and actually spent time with them? Because this is, you know, delirium is acute. That's, you know, they, that means it happens right away and they go from whatever their baseline is to start raving like they're trying to run down the hall out to Grant Road. So that's delirium. And that's a, that is not a sign that you have dementia. It is not a permanent state of being. Again, People who have less cognitive reserve are more at risk, but really it could happen to anybody. And the longer you're in the hospital, the more likely it is to happen. But the, the thing I worry about with a lot of our older adults, um, and that would include my own parents, is the isolation. You know, um, COVID has been a big problem for that because many people do live alone for a variety of reasons. And when your social interactions are cut off, it is not good for your brain. And, you know, somebody who was really pretty darn functional and tooling along, this is exactly the sort of thing that would upset the apple cart and really just accelerate their decline. Because, again, where's the stimulus? I mean, and you can go back to those experiments they did with baby rhesus monkeys and wire cages. If the brain does not get appropriate stimulus, and I think this is true across the lifespan, as, as well as at certain critical stages of development, if it doesn't get that, it degenerates. You know, because it's got, I mean, you know, you're essentially, it's like putting it in a sort of a a dream state or something, you know, it's sort of existing, but it's not really, you know, it's not being stimulated, it's not really doing anything, and that's a decline. That is a decline. Plasticity can also mean a decline. So we want to focus on the other part. How do we prevent that? Um, I just did that one because I liked the little cartoons. <laughs> but we we have really pretty much talked about this, you know. So, right. In, in from my point of view, being in, on the clinical side, neurology again, we we often focus on the pathology. I see people with strokes. I see people with, you know, long term changes from from neurodegenerative disorders. So, and that literally can be anything from Parkinson's to one of the dementias to some of the autoimmune stuff, et cetera. Um, and, you know, really, that can also include people who have bad spine disease, you know, bad neck, bad back, that significantly um, limits some people in terms of either pain or literally functional capacity. You know, they have trouble walking, they have trouble standing, et cetera. But it's still so, so important to keep them moving and keep them doing something because that way, you know, does it restore them back to what they were before those things happened? No, probably not. But you can always improve function. You know, here's here's my. Uh, I mean, it's it's really my very last slide, but I'm gonna say it anyway. It is a use it or lose it proposition across the board, whether you're talking about physical function or whether you're talking about cognitive function. Use it or lose it. It's just really, and then we can all. I, you know, I feel like in my life, I went through a period of time where I was kind of almost in stasis. You know, I'd go to work, do my thing, go home. You know, I had my routine or whatever. And when I look back on that now, I'm like, 
you know, I think I was actually regressing during that period of my life. And so thankfully, um, ultimately, not only did I end up going back to school, but then for compliance reasons, because I went back to work in the hospital, I had to go back to school. So I have all this alphabet soup after my name, and I still have to work. But, um, <laughs> but, but it was good for me, because again, it challenged me in ways that I really, really, you know, didn't want to do, but I'm glad I did, ultimately. So these are the, exactly the stuff I talk about. I just put it in color, you know, so it's easier to read. Um, and I do, I really do think these two have the greatest impact. And if you can combine them, like you got an exercise group or you have a gr bridge, you know, play bridge. I have a friend who retired and decided that's what you want to do. I'm like, Carolyn, that sounds like work to me. But, you know, my mom's a bridge player too. Um, and uh, to this day, um, from early childhood to this day, I don't get that game and I will never be good at it. So I probably should take it up. But if, you know, but if you like, you know, so if you like crossword puzzles, you like anagrams, you're a word person, and you're like, okay, start playing Scrabble because you have to play Scrabble with other people. And uh, play Bananagrams, if, especially if you've got grandkids, that is a great game. I used to play that with my kids. Y'all know what Bananagrams are? It's, it's literally a banana with a zipper and it's got tiles in it like, um, like Scrabble, and you shake it, and it's got a little, um, what do you call those things with the sand? You know? Timer. Yeah, it's a little timer, right? You know, I don't know what I know they have a name, but I can't think of it. Yeah, there we go, an hourglass. It's really probably a five minute glass, but, but you know, you shake it up, and you put that little thing out, and you get your tiles, and you have to make as many words as you can with that. And it's, you know, it's a fun thing, but boy, that's good for you too, because you got to think quick. Play Uno, you know, find a bunch of people to play Uno one. That'll get your heart rate up too. Um, let's see, there you go. See, I, that pretty much sums it up because I really think that when it looks from, from a neurology perspective, when we talk about what is the best thing you can do for your brain to try and prevent um, as much as we can, the, the ravages of time and just time on the planet, life in general, and that can include bad things like strokes, etc. So what can you do to help yourself recover in the event that you have one of those bad things happen to you, or just to live the fullest life you can for however long you have on the earth? This is it right here. You know, um, there's, it's not like magic. It's not like any big secret, and it's not about how many supplements you take or whatever. I mean, you know, for the most part, if you have a reasonably good diet, especially if you're taking a, a multivitamin, they're micronutrients. They're called micronutrients for a reason. I have people come in that've got like, you know, uh, a list of medications as long as my forearm and half of them are supplements. I'm like, you have very expensive urine. But remember, <laughs> it's an industry, right? And the people selling you the stuff are the ones telling you what it's gonna do for you. And I'm like, and who's watching them? You know, I've been like, show me the data. So I'm not saying some isn't good, but for the most part, again, most people don't need them or don't need them to that degree. So, uh, questions? So, thank you, Fran. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll actually ask a couple of questions first, and then we can turn it over to the room. So, one of the questions that I had that came in was, is it ever too late to start working or enhancing your brain plasticity? No, it's never, ever, never, never. It is never too late. And I think, so if somebody has, say, an advanced dementia or something, yeah, again, that takes away your capacity to learn. But, you know, many times, and this is the great tragedy of it, you've got somebody who's still relatively healthy. You know what? So you still do the same thing. You still engage them. You know, you still have them go out for daily walks. You have them play games, do whatever. That's still going to benefit them. You know, but the worst thing you can do to anybody, no matter what their neurologic state is, to stick them in a wheelchair or a chair and part of the price is right. That's never good for anybody. Okay. And what about stress? How does stress, re how does stress affect our brain plasticity? Because I feel like everybody has got stress in their lives. And how does that, what, what do we do about that? Okay, so that is actually an excellent question. I'm sorry I didn't address that because we know that stress has negative impact on the brain on the neurons themselves, you know, on these neurotransmitters. So here's the reality though, nobody lives a stress-free life, right? But this is where, this is where probably strategies and things, which, and I think go to the next level beyond strategy. And, and again, embrace that brain plasticity is we need to help people manage their stress, 
right? So we used to think call those strategies and we think those are coping mechanisms, but I would take it one step further because if you're really doing it right, you're changing things. You're changing how those neurons talk to each other and you're changing those networks, you're changing structural stuff, you know, and I think that's very effective. It's not, you know, medicines can help, don't get me wrong, there is a role for that, but really it is learning how to manage it because there are some things in our lives we can't change, so all you can change is how you respond to it. And this is where a good therapist is worth their weight in gold, you know, because not many psychiatrists even do psychotherapy anymore. They're, they're there to prescribe the meds, but meds are only gonna take you so far. And here's the other thing, also very important, which I thank you for bringing that up because I think this has a big role in brain plasticity too. We are a nation of people who don't sleep well. I mean, it's a huge problem. Look, you know, look at all the sleep aids. If you always, if you want to know if something's really a problem, go walking down an aisle in a drugstore and see how many things there are to treat that problem. And sleep is a big issue in this country. And I'll tell you, in that really negatively impacts your brain. It negatively impacts your ability to deal with stress, right? You know how we always say, get a good night's sleep and look better in the morning. You don't think clearly when you're overwhelmed, but you know you can't think clearly when your brain is tired. It needs that regenerative sleep. It doesn't necessarily have to be eight hours a day. You know, we sleep differently as we age. What you need is the good REM sleep. And what a lot of those sleep aids do is interfere with your REM sleep. They might get you to sleep, and you might, you might stay asleep a little bit longer, but you're not necessarily getting good quality sleep. You might not still be getting enough REM sleep. And that's the brain's time to reset. And so, and we're also a nation that has crappy sleep hygiene, like just horrible. Whoever thought it was a good idea to put TVs in bedrooms, bad idea, bad idea. And, and now we all have all, and I'm guilty as the next person. I mean, we all got our phones that are now computers. We have e-readers, you know, we got our tablets, all of that. But the screens are stimuli to the brain. Those are actually literally direct stimuli to the brain. So that's why we say if you're having trouble sleeping, if your trouble is getting to sleep, don't look at any of that stuff for at least two hours before you go to bed. Because like I said, it's a direct stimulus. It's like exercising. Some people can exercise and then go to bed, but not too many because exercise is a stimulus too. So you want to do it at some part of the day where it's not going to keep you up at night. If you're a night owl, that's fine. You don't have to change being a night owl, but you should have sufficient sleep. If you have excessive daytime sleepiness, then you have to ask yourself what's wrong with the picture. You know, am I really not a night person and I'm just watching too much TV? Do I have sleep apnea? That's also a big one. If you have sleep apnea that's not diagnosed and not treated, you will have bad sleep and that will set you up for, again, neurodegenerative stuff down the road. And if you have other chronic illnesses, it will interfere with how well those can be managed because you know it's sort of like having a bad thyroid that's not treated. No matter what we throw at you, you're not going to be as affected because the body doesn't process it appropriately. So um, sleep is a big deal. And oh, and I didn't say this either. See, look at all these new points you brought up. Um, <laughs> if you have chronic conditions, whatever they may be, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, whatever the case may be, manage them. You know, can you make them go away? No, but you should manage them. You know. Make sure your blood sugar stays in a reason because, you know, the brain's main fuel is sugar. So having a low blood sugar is bad for you, but having a really high one is not good for you either. One of the best analogies I've ever heard was from, I was at a lecture um, when I was going to take my boards and the nurse practitioner was like, all right, this is how I want you to think about diabetes. When you cut an apple and you put it on the counter, what happens? It starts to get that little brown slimy stuff on it. Yes, she goes, that's uncontrolled diabetes. I'm like, oh, isn't that a great example? So, you know, I mean, you think about that and you're like, yes, yes, you should control your sugar. So um, so now you'll think of that. And I, I had an anatomy professor once who do an endocrine talking about um, acromegaly, um, which is excessive growth. Image. <laughs> he said, okay, look at a beagle and look at a basset hound. So a basset hound is a beagle with acromegaly. I've never forgotten that like you know, 40 years ago. But anyway, sorry. Another question? No, so that, that's great. I do want to just share with everyone that we are continuing on with our series. I know you mentioned how games were really important to helping with our brain plasticity and sort of thinking outside of your normal or your regular 
comfort zone, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So we do have classes coming up. We have one uh, that is tomorrow, which is on move your body, boost your brain. And we have another one coming up at the end of the month called Game Your Brain. And so these are ways for people to learn some new skills that they might not do, might be a little bit outside your comfort zone when you or you haven't done them in a long time. And so they're sort of a fun way to try to re-engage in trying some new activities. So I did want to share that with everyone. Um, so Fran, I want to thank you for being here. I'm going to turn it back over so you can uh, answer any questions in the oh. audience. And then, um, and we're going to close off online. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks again for being here today. If you are interested in any of the classes I just mentioned, the Move Your Body or Boost Your Brain, that is on Thursday, March 9th at 10 a.m., please give us a call at 520-324-1960 to register. This class is only available in person. We also have openings for Game Your Brain, which is on Wednesday, March 29th at 10 a.m. Again, that class will be in person and you can call 520-324-1960. If you're interested in our next online presentation, we'll be holding that next Tuesday, March 14th, and that is Cellular and Cognitive Benefits of Exercise. Um, please go ahead and call the number and we will get you registered for the in-person class, I'm sorry, the uh, online uh, class for that, as well as Be Fast, Know the Signs of Stroke. That'll be on Thursday, March 16th at 10 a.m. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.